Welcome to episode three in our Commerce Reimagined series, highlighting change makers, visionaries, and the people who are transforming the way we are defining commerce in this ever changing, evolving world right now. Hi, I am Beth Ann Kamiko, and I'm the global CEO of Geometry. And I'm here to welcome Rachel Tipograph, who is the founder of a company called Micmac. Prior to that, she was the global director of um, social media and digital for The Gap. And she is a well-known, recognized leader in innovation across the commerce space. Um, she's been highlighted in For Forbes 30 Under 30. She's also been part of the Marie Claire's 50 Most Influential Women in America and Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business. It is my pleasure to rec recognize and um, welcome Rachel. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Great to have you here. So we have a lot to talk about today. <laughs> we are both living through a time that we didn't imagine, but a, I think, result of the time that we did imagine. So we both have been, I think, a little bit ahead of the game sometimes when we thought about the future of commerce and what we see happening from a retail transformation, adoption of new commerce channels standpoint. So I'd love to get into that conversation with you today. And I think we're going to cover it in like two major themes, I would say. One is around this kind of changing consumer demand and how we see this adoption curve happening right now and what that means for the future. And then the other is around um, the unexpected elements of it for retailers and for brands, who was more prepared, who was less prepared, and some examples of ones of companies that are, are dealing really well and what we can learn from that as well. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll jump off into the first part of the conversation, Rachel. Um, first of all, is there anything that you would like to say to give the audience some context to Micmac and your business and you know the world that you're living in right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for those of uh, you who don't know who we are, Micmac is an e-commerce platform for multi-channel brands. So if the majority of your sales come from places like Amazon, Target, Walmart, Kroger, Peabody, Drizzly, Minibar, Ulta, Sephora... Uh, you will eventually likely become my client because you live in darkness with e-retail data. And so I built software that allows brands like Unilever and Nestle and Hershey's and Lego and L'Oreal uh, to own as much of the customer journey as humanly possible while still driving sales at their biggest marketplaces and wholesalers. And I have the pleasure of working with Geometry on a bunch of client overlaps. We do, and we enjoy working with you guys. It's um, it's a good collaboration, and we love how you push the thinking as well, and especially what you guys do in the in the vid, vid, more video digital domains. So let's go into that a little bit more and talk a bit about what we're seeing in terms of the changing trends. So it's funny because a lot of us were counting grocery out, especially some of the smaller grocers. And if you think about it more from a local standpoint, I think a lot of us have not just self-isolated, but we've gone back to our neighborhoods, our communities. And so local is the first place that we'll think. And we've seen this spike in e-grocery from a, a local standpoint. I would love to hear your thoughts around that. Is this going to be a lasting change in behavior? Are their businesses going to not just thrive through this, but continue to innovate and step up to this challenge? Or at some point, does just the dominance of Amazon and other big players come back into the mix? Yeah, I mean, it's such a wild time uh, to paint the picture. You know, if, if you're a brand that's available at a grocery store, and you spoke to me in February, what you probably would have told me is that of all of your revenue, only 3% is coming from e-commerce. And then all of a sudden, the week of March 9th happened. And you looked at your numbers and you go, wait a second, what in the world just happened? Because you see that around a third of your revenue is coming from e-commerce. So literally overnight, consumer demand shifted by five years. Where the industry thought we would be in the year 2025 literally happened on March 10th and it hasn't stopped. Now that's just at the grocery level. If you take something like spirits, that even was smaller, like if you talk to Moe Hennessy or Miller's Coors, what they would have told you is that only 1% of their overall revenue came from e-com. Fast forward to March 10th, depending on what state you're in, it's now anywhere between 50 and 
of Spirits Brands revenue. So this shift is wild. The second thing, Beth Ann, that you were alluding to uh, is a really big change, not only in consumer demand, but how consumers choose to shop. So a big part of what we do at Micmac is give the customer the power to choose where they want to check out. So if you've ever been anywhere, whether it's Instagram, paid search, Hulu, and you clicked on an ad from a brand, and then all of a sudden you could choose Amazon, Target, Walmart, that's my company behind the scenes powering it. I've been doing this for three years. And what I could tell you over those three years is that retailer preference really mattered. Meaning if you were Sephora loyalist, it didn't matter what sale Ulta had, you were only shopping at Sephora. To your point, that's changed. Mm-hmm. What consumers care most about right now is how do I get what I want immediately? Meaning the first question that they're looking to answer is, is the product in stock? If it's in stock at a local grocery versus Walmart, they're going to go to the local grocery, even if they've never shopped there before. Once they decide if the product's in stock or not, the second thing is shipping. So how quickly can I get this product? Are they a part of Instacart? Is there a click and collect? Or am I going to have to wait weeks for this product to arrive? And then finally, the last thing is price. So in the grocery world, this is such a huge shift because if this was February, what I would have told you is the first thing that mattered is retailer preference. The second thing that mattered was price. So this is a major opportunity for more of that long tail of retailers because consumers are willing to give you a shot as long as the product is in stock. So that's an interesting point about like if the product is in stock and in our research, which we're doing right now to understand what's changing, we see that people are more willing than I think they would normally be to switch out their brands. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if they get a note back that basically says, would you be willing to get this kind of yogurt instead, or even sometimes like almost across category, switching out, um, you know, sour cream for cottage cheese, if it's an ingredient list or something like that, I think we're seeing people are way more open to some of those switches than they typically would be. That's number one. Number two, we have also seen this huge return to comfort foods or doing things that they see as treating their family. So things that would maybe have normally been off the health list are now coming back on the list because they're, you know, some of that processed food category, for instance, that you wouldn't typically go to when you're you know, feeding your family has become feeding and nurturing the soul right now and sort of creating good times and, 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 you know, just more desire around the dinner table. Are, are you seeing those trends as well? And, w- and really specifically from a brand standpoint in terms of how brands are activating around these consumer changes, are you seeing things that you think are particularly innovative? Or are you guys working on things, that, some examples yeah. that are really innovative? Your insights align with our insights. So one of my big clients is the Hershey Company. And Doug Stratton, if you guys don't follow him on LinkedIn or Twitter, you should. He really is another thought leader in the space. Uh, And he came from Unilever prior. You know, uh, I had him recently uh, speak publicly at a webinar that I was hosting and he shared this information. Like their business is performing phenomenally well. America is returning back to those namesake brands. So their oldest candies are performing the best right now. But also in their recent earnings call, they shared that they've seen a decline in their mint and gum business. Why? Because people aren't socializing anymore. So they don't care about their breath. So <laughs> it's, like, it's like actually ridiculous, like how common sense this is. But when you think about your own merchandising strategy, I think you have to take into account like what products are appropriate for social distancing and now what are not necessary. And with that, you know, I don't just work in grocery. I work across a diverse set of product categories. So when I first started my business three years ago, the first brands to sign up were beauty. I've seen a huge change right now within the beauty industry. So products that are killing it are definitely in that personal care space. So the same way that you're nourishing yourself with like America's oldest candies, you also really want to take good care of your skin right now. So skincare is killing it. What's not doing so well? More of the color cosmetics or more of the luxury items. And, you know, I did start my career at Gap. My heart goes out to all my friends there and anyone who's in the apparel footwear industry right now, but like no one's buying fashion. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think there are some categories that 
our counter cycle to Corona. Mm -hmm. And then there are other categories that are really hurting. And I'm not sure when we get out of it, if a lot of those brands are still going to exist. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And it is sad to see those areas of retail that were already challenged now really being tested as the changes are taking place. Um, even in the e-commerce world, like we all know that people were investing and they're building the capability, but they weren't moving fast enough. And then something like this comes around and the rest of the market that wasn't adopting e-commerce, you know, in, in their mix of retail and stock up are now going into that space. So we've got, you know, grandmas and grandpas and, you know, the next generation and even younger generations, quite frankly, that are now also um, ordering in new ways. So what do you think from a, you know, retailers that are less capable and also, you know, just the role that brands play in that in terms of their own strategies of distribution and fulfillment, if, if everything starts to disproportionately go to more of an e-commerce mix, how do brands catch up either right now or as we look to the recovery, what can brands be doing and retailers be doing to get more capable over this time? Yeah. I think there are three core things that any brand that's been disrupted by this change in consumer demand need to immediately wrangle together. You need to be able to connect your supply chain. So like whatever you're using for an ERP to your e platforms to the media you have in market. To give you a perfect example, like, you know, take my clients at SC Johnson. Obviously, their, their products are flying off the shelf right now. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand where do we have product in stock? Where is their demand that we currently can't fulfill? And maybe how do we move inventory into those environments? And then how do we marry that to the media that we have in market? I would say that's the most, most important thing for every single brand right now to get a hold of. Obviously, Micmac is a partner that helps you solve that. But there are other partners out there, too. Um, and that's critical. The second biggest thing is if you're in a high growth category right now, there is an opportunity to capitalize on this momentum. So it's kind of, it's hard to say to yourself, wait a second, what were the other changes that were happening in the ecosystem before COVID? But if we all wind back the clock to late February, like the hot topic in our industry was a cookie-less internet right? Mm -hmm. So 2022, Google's going to kill cookies. This is going to have a massive impact on e and marketing at large, meaning it's actually going to become more challenging for brands to own that customer relationship. So there is a window of time right now where you as a brand can own as much of that customer journey and customer data as humanly possible. So you can even be more prepared for 2022. And so the other big thing that brands need to be considering is how do you try to own that digital storefront experience? Meaning if consumers are going to Amazon or they're going to Walmart or they're even going to your local grocery via Instacart, how do you put yourself in a position from a technology standpoint to essentially be able to put a pixel there, whether it's Facebook or Pinterest or Crux or Newstar, like doesn't matter. So you can capture that audience data and that can live in your ad manager and your customer data platform. And then finally, the last piece is creative. So you can't really do original content shoots right now. And a big part of driving conversion and also protecting your brand health to ensure you're not being tone deaf at a time where a lot of people might not be receptive to messaging is ensuring that your e creative is designed for conversion. And so those are the, be the things that I would be thinking about right now if I was sitting brand side, which is the tech stack that's going to allow you to connect supply chain to e-com to media, your ability to collect audience data because 2022 is going to be here before you know it, and then fixing your creative to drive conversion and protect your brand to ensure you're not tone deaf. Spot on. And that middle piece um, is something that can be done whether you're you know, full direct to consumer channel or you're thinking about it through you know, third parties or other platforms. So on staying on this theme of thinking about the future and what, what we're predicting and projecting is going to come, uh, so much of what we thought even a year or two years, you're, you're, you're kind of talking 2022, is now actually speeding up because of the pace of what's just happened right now. 
Um, one, do we think that sort of pace of adoption is going to continue? So people are going to be hungrier for more innovative methods and, and be more open to establishing new habits and behaviors. And then two, when we do look further down, whether it's through 5G and AR and VR and voice, obviously, we're seeing become more important, the whole Internet of Things, or what would you say is we should be betting on and we should be starting to think about in our pipelines of innovation when we start to get into 22, 23 and 24 years? Yeah. Um, there's so much. There's so many things to consider. But I would say the things that are on the top of my head right now is I absolutely believe that consumer behavior is fundamentally changed. The analogy that I'm making to people is like, remember 2010 when Uber came to market? And then all of a sudden we all forgot how to hail a taxi, right? Like consumer behavior fundamentally changed. Or you get out of a taxi and you leave your credit card in there all the time. Or I mean, you forget to pay. I do that sometimes. <laughs> like you forget. Right? Like Uber changed the way that we get into cars. COVID changed the way that consumers shop. And it takes 21 days to build a habit. We are now well beyond that. I think we're in week seven or eight of COVID. People have now spent seven or eight weeks buying their groceries and booze and home care products online. That's not going to go away, especially when it's very likely that we're about to have government mandates to be buying your groceries online. So those two dynamics, the behavior is absolutely here to stay. So that changes a lot of things. First, let's just talk about like the unit economics of grocery. So from a retailer standpoint, they actually don't love what's happening right now because it hasn't been figured out. So um, to put this all into a frame of reference for everyone, if you placed an order online, let's just take Whole Foods, and a Whole Foods employee fulfilled the order, Whole Foods is actually going to lose $10. If you, you place an order online and you do it via Instacart, meaning an Instacart employee is the one who's going to get the items from Whole Foods, Whole Foods is going to lose like $4, but they're still losing money. The only way that the unit economics of online grocery, especially in this perishable last mile world works is that there's automation, meaning robots. Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that that will happen over the next few years, because I believe there's a group of people right now, either in Pittsburgh or Silicon Valley that are accelerating their business to figure out how to solve this problem at scale. Once that happens, I think there's going to be so much disruption in the last mile delivery market. Mm -hmm. it's not just going to be the Instacart or Postmates is the only game in town. There's going to be so many new businesses that evolve as well as advertising opportunities. And I think it's going to create also really new, interesting opportunities for brands to own that experience, as well as introduce sampling into that environment. So that's one big prediction. The second big thing is I think that brands are going to um, be challenged on how to bring new products to market. So the thing about online grocery is once a customer does enjoy their order, a typical consumer behavior is just to replenish. Mm -hmm. So we all get in a habit, right? Like I have a hummus brand that I love. I don't really want to deviate from it unless it's out of stock. So I think about if you think about how products come to market, it's going to have to be different because you're not going to have that physical store experience where you're browsing and you give something a shot because of packaging or there's an in-store sampling play. So I also believe all of that's going to change. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, it's just within the organization. Like, you know, I like you, Beth Ann, work with these huge brands. And I would say by and large today, Ecom still sits under the sales organization, mm -hmm. meaning it's not the heartbeat of what they do. Yep. In the next two years, COVID is going to accelerate how brands reorganize around Ecom. And I believe that it's going to become a central function the way that CRM is a central function. Mm -hmm. Those are my three big predictions. That's an, that last one's an interesting one. We could have a whole topic just on that, just to tease out all the things that are connected 
to that idea. Um, I think also to that point, like when you think about it from a geography standpoint, it has always amazed me how much in some ways the United States is behind China in terms mm -hmm. of the social network around commerce mm -hmm. and how much there's this social selling that just is natural in that culture. And all of, you know, like I think about what's what economically is it going to take to really stimulate the economy again? And if I always look at like what could those tools be? that empower a new generation of people to make money in new ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of wonder, is there something that would propel social commerce to being more universal and, and more present in the way that we shop? Yeah, it's funny. Um, you know, we were, we were starting to see it in the secondary market. So like apps like Poshmark, the real, real, like that is actually just social selling. Yep. Um, and the reason why I'm pausing right now is because I do think there's going to be this other shift in consumer behavior, which is we are actually all going to want to own again. So for the last 10 years, it's been about rent, 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 whether it's Zipcar or rent the runway or Uber or. You know, and, yeah. that. I think health and safety are going to continue to be paramount, at least for the next two years until there's mass testing and a vaccine. And so when it comes to social selling, I, new, new ways of doing it are absolutely going to emerge. I guess my big question is around like what merchandising and inventory opportunity, because there has to be a true like end consumer value proposition. Uh, it can't just be like endorsing the product. And so I haven't completely figured it out because if you would have spoken to me in February, I was so behind the secondary market. Um, cause I was seeing great growth behaviors with Gen Z because they're so, uh, environmentally conscious, but now I challenge it. Like I, I really believe that people are going to want to own brand new, super sanitary items right now. So there will be something around social shelling. I just don't know what the merchandising opportunity is yet. Yeah, no, that those are all really good points. And I do think when you look at more macro trends, it's going to be interesting to see these bigger themes that we saw going in a certain direction in terms of urbanization mm -hmm. and sharing economies that are going to maybe get either reversed or really challenged and have to rethink this new element of sanitation or these sort of new value propositions to, to really be able to flourish. And to, to go on your point of looking at Asia to see what's happening, um, you know, I recently had a conversation and a webinar with the CMO of Ford and early signals for them are in China, people are buying cars at an unprecedented rate right now. So that's, that's a pretty big indicator to me. Mm -hmm. Rachel, it is always amazing to talk to you. You have so much great experience and um, just thinking of, on the space in like a really rigorous way. Uh, I want to, I want you just to leave us with one more sort of uh, prediction or call out in terms of, is there a winner brand that you see in all of this that we weren't really thinking on our radar before that you see really emerging? And is there somebody else that you see that we did kind of have on our radar before, but you just see really benefiting right now that is going to be sustained? Yeah. Um, I would say the brands that I'm so excited about are, are these legacy brands that have been investing in e-com for you know, the last three to five years. So P&G, Hershey's, Essie Johnson, um, like Keurig Dr. Pepper, like these brands were early to the e-com game and understood we, we have to build out this foundation. And as a result, they've solved for the three big things that I've spoken about. In terms of like more of a new challenger brand that I think is poised for continued growth and everyone should probably buy their stock if they haven't yet is Peloton right? Like what Peloton recognized is people aren't going to want to always go to SoulCycle or can't do that because they live in the suburbs. And they built an experience with a high price point product that has a subscription business on top of it. And I think that they've also diversified in terms of content. It's not just about the bike. You know, I have the app on my phone. There's so much content. Uh, and I'm very, very bullish on that type of business model for the continued future. For sure. They're definitely a winner in all of this. I know so many people that have bought Peloton bikes during this time. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that they're having their own supply chain issues right now. 
hundred percent. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. And I know that you're someone who loves to get reached out to. So if anybody is wanting to follow Rachel, learn more, you can definitely get, connect with her on LinkedIn and all of her other social channels. Uh, again, Rachel Tipograph, thank you so much for your time today and um, look forward to chatting with you again soon. And for everyone else, look forward to welcoming you back to Commerce Reimagined sometime soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.